Hey friends, it's Aislinn and Joe, and I am super excited to now have a playlist on the Aislinn Campbell YouTube channel, Dinner Table Talks. Exactly. So while you're here on my YouTube channel, subscribe to Aislinn Campbell. You'll see all the cool stuff I'm putting out. Super cool. And be sure to like this podcast as well. And while you're listening, go over to your favorite podcast platform. You know the whole list. Go wherever you go and like, rate, and subscribe to us there as as well. It helps us out. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite beverage. We have got so much to talk about. This is one of those weeks and weekends where the calendar is so full that we're wedging in the recording of the podcast on Saturday to be released on Monday with Sunday Mother's Day in between. In between. And all four kids are home. Oh my God, all four kids. Aislinn. No unnecessary words today. We've got to record succinctly and tightly so that I can edit this up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm going to let you grade me on how well I listen today. Oh, no, I'm relying on you to do a lot of talking. <laughs> Our first dinner table talk salon was last night. And yep. we're going to tell you every detail. With all four kids driving into town right as it was about to start. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about your very first day on the farm event mm -hmm. and how it was an evolutionary event for the farm and the kinds of events and things we're going to do out here and it becoming an educational hub for, you know, South Texas. Figuring out what we want to do and seeing what it feels like and do we like it and is the return on investment of the energy balance that I always like to talk about there. Well, last night to me, the salon was another evolutionary event and we'll get into yes. why that was the yes. case here in just a second. But I want to remind everybody that we are naming a chicken right now. I was telling the folks at the event last night that we've got the names for the chickens and I pointed out the chicken that were named and I was like, Pepper, Audrey Henburn, Houdini, Millie, and Dirty Martini. But then I went on to tell them we're, we're lobbying for our favorite names and that I think you're lobbying for Dirty Martini. You and think I, that? And, and they were like, oh, and I said, well, she's an olive egger. So, okay, I, I can see that. And I was like, I think I kind of like Pepper. And one of the ladies goes... She does look like a pepper, too. <laughs> so. so there's a photo up at the top of our Facebook page, pinned to the top, and a link for you to vote for your favorite name for this chicken. We're going to do this for a couple more weeks. I don't think that you're correct about oh. which name I'm lobbying oh. for. I've tried to stay out of it. Uh -huh, Dirty uh -huh. Martini is a very creative name for uh -huh. an olive egger, but uh -huh. I don't know if that's the uh -huh. best name for her. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Pepper, Audrey Hinburn, Houdini, Millie, or Dirty Martini. Go look at the chicken yeah. and vote. Please vote. Now, this is ladies' choice. Over the last two weeks, we've discussed this blue zone concept, that there are five geographical parts in the world where the population have longer lives, healthier lives. Ladies' choice, do you want to discuss another blue zone today? Yeah, I actually had an idea. Well, in that case... Ooh. Unanswered questions. So if this is your first time to listen or you haven't heard the last two weeks... There are five blue zones. Two weeks ago, we discussed Loma Linda, California in the United States. Mm -hmm. Last week, we discussed Sardinia, Italy. And while they are so drastically different culturally, mm -hmm. we found some commonalities as to why these are pockets of healthier lifestyle and longer living. Importance of family, no smoking, plant-heavy diet, constant moderate physical activity, keeping social engagement between the elderly and the rest of the community, a lot of whole grains, and they are both culturally isolated. Mm -hmm. In one of the conversations last week, I brought up this recipe book that my mom had brought over for us to look through. And it's called The Blue Zones Kitchen. She had this even before we knew we were going to ever talk about Blue Zones? Yeah. Our, uh, in her library? Somebody in our family sent it over to us because she thought that they, you know, we would have an interest in it. And I did mention last week, 100 Recipes to Live to be 100 Years Old. It's like a coffee table book. There you go. It's a coffee table book. That's exactly right. Beautiful pictures. And the stories that the guy was telling were really great. And I flipped over to Nicoya, Costa Rica. That's one of the five. Yes. His initial introduction to Nicoya, Costa Rica. Oh my gosh. We have absolutely have to talk about this on the podcast because I feel like this is a free the taco moment here on Dinner Table Talks. And as often as we talk about tacos on the podcast. Anything goes good on a taco. And that we talk about healthy lifestyle and South Texas mm -hmm. and all of the things that we talk about, not only is it about tacos and freeing the taco, but it's also about breakfast 
And Saturday mornings, we talk about how we like to make a good breakfast. It's often a taco on Saturday mornings. It's usually brunch, not breakfast. Or an errant weekends. I will go down to the taqueria and mm-hmm. pick up a bunch of tacos and eggs for you. And we'll use our gluten-free tortillas for you. But tacos abound. Yeah. But the one thing that I want to, to point out as you're listening to this is that one of the things that we're often conditioned to believe, and I've talked a lot about this recently, about the stories and where did that story come from, where has that story led us to, and what has it gotten us to then believe about what is occurring today. Coming out of the healthcare system, coming out of the rise in pediatric diabetes, I remember when the conversation about type 2 diabetes in children was becoming an epidemic, that was the conversation. This is an epidemic, right? And then what ended up happening was there was a lot of like cultural blaming that started occurring, especially in South Texas, because culturally here in South Texas, we eat tortillas, beans, rice. like, And also culturally in South Texas, the stories that we have been told Mm -hmm. and what appears to be anecdotally true is that like these blue zones are pockets of health, Mm -hmm. that South Texas down to the valley and the Mexico border. Right. Is this pocket of obesity, Uh diabetes, Uh and that's the story that... That's being told. That's being told, but appears to be true. Well, I mean, there's certainly parts of it that are true. I mean, as much as I have looked into, studied, and been aware of South Texas health and lifestyle, I've seen some of the things that they're talking about. There's no doubt about that. And then there was some conversation at the dinner table last night that talked about how they moved the benchmark. So what was considered diabetic before isn't considered diabetic anymore or vice versa, or there's so many more people that are considered. Right. Pre-diabetes is normalized. Right. And really what I know about being there in the healthcare industry when that shift was starting to occur was that the doctor, the endocrinologist was simply trying to encourage people to stop drinking so many soda waters Mm -hmm. and stop, you know, whatever. But somehow it becomes this cultural story about how it's because we eat tortillas and beans Mm -hmm. and we eat breakfast and we, you know, whatever. Cheap cheese. So I read this this morning and I was like, we're going to free the taco today. And I loved it. He said, I may have found the world's healthiest breakfast. It's tucked away in Nicoya, Costa Rica. Early in the morning at 4 a.m., A bunch of women are stoking the wood fires in long clay ovens. They put on cauldrons of spicy beans to boil, and they mix corn dough, nixtamal, with wood ash, according to an ancient technique dating back to at least 8,000 years ago. Wood ash in the tortilla. That's what they're saying. Interesting. One of the women pinches off a golf ball-sized piece of dough on a piece of waxed paper and rotates it with mechanical precision into a perfectly round patty. Mm. She immediately slaps it onto a hot clay plate or a comal. Immediately when I started reading that, I was like, she's making tortillas. Yeah, and totally. I'm like, oh. So she roasts this beautiful tortilla until it gets into this puffy disc and then it collapses into a tortilla. At the other end of the wood stove, three other women mix beans with onions, red peppers, and local herbs. Mm -hmm. The beans cook slowly for about an hour to tender perfection and are then mixed into rice to produce the uniquely Costa Rican gallo pinto, rice and beans. Okay, now we've got tortillas, rice, and beans. At 6 a.m., the first customer files in. Most of them market vendors or laborers. They take seats on benches at long green tables. Sounds like a taco truck to me. Yeah. (laughs) It sounds like every corner in our town. Exactly. Cooperative waitresses wearing simple dresses and flip-flops serve giant cups of weak local coffee, steaming plates of the gallo pinto, and baskets of warm tortillas. As muddy ranchero music plays from a distant radio, customers fill their tortillas with beans topped with Chilero hot sauce. This is arguably the most perfect food combination ever. And for some, it brings forth tears of joy. I can imagine that. The corn tortillas, chewy with nutty flavor, are an excellent source of a whole grain, low glycemic, complex carbohydrates. The wood ash breaks down the corn's cell walls, making niacin bioavailable and freeing amino acids so the body can absorb them. That's a whole lot of science about plants and lifestyle and how our body takes in different nutrients based on how we do different the things The science of the taco, if you will. Exactly. The black beans contain the same pigment based in anthocyanins, antioxidants, we've heard that before, that are found in blueberries. They're rich, colon cleansing, blood pressure lowering, and insulin regulating. 
and they are filled with folates like potassium and B vitamins to boot. The bean and rice combination creates a whole protein, which is to say all the amino acids necessary for human sustenance. It goes on to talk about the coffee and the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant and anti-cancer properties of coffee and the curcumin that's in the seasoning and the chilero that's made with vinegar and carrots. We make the vinegar carrot hot sauce, the Belizean style. They're, they're getting some probiotics in their diet. Yep. Total cost of the breakfast, $4.23, a very nice price to discover Nicoya's secrets to longevity. Free the taco! Well, so there's an interesting dichotomy there because the taco that I pick up at the taqueria doesn't feel like it's bursting with health. Are they talking about lard in their tortillas? I'm talking about the mass-produced rice, beans, tortillas available in the American market. There's a couple of things going on here. One of those is labeling cultures. The way you eat is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that certainly is what they say about South Texas and the Valley. Right. And it's not about the fact that it's the American processed diet that's potentially causing the issues. It's about that your culture of tortillas, beans, and rice, and chile breakfast Mm -hmm. is not healthy. Your culture is not healthy. And that's some of the wording that is, it becomes a thing that denigrates cultures and people and makes it easy to kind of like pick on people and, and things like that. But the thing about it is, is that it's not about the separate ingredients. It's not about the culturally appropriate food as it seems to appear in this particular story, right? In this story, it's not about the food, the cultural food. It's about the way the food is prepared. And in America, it's prepared for highly, highly cheap commoditization and distribution. Right. Which doesn't have anything to do with the basic original ingredients that were formulated 800 years ago and were used on an island to the point where now they have some of the oldest, healthiest people on the island and they eat that for breakfast every morning. You could hear your scratching of your beard in the background behind me talking. And sometimes a beard has to be scratched. (laughs) When I read that this morning, I was like, we have to talk about that on the podcast because these are important conversations to be had about why we create the stories that we create. And let's break that, break it down and talk about some of the other stories that can help us get a better understanding of what is going on with our health globally amongst us. And then when you look at even other factors of Nicoya, they have a plan de vida, strong sense of purpose. A strong sense of purpose. They're inspired. That strong sense of purpose has been such a big part of the ongoing conversation these days. Mm-hmm. That what is, why am I here? You well, know? It goes back to our conversation last week about Sardinia and how they treat their elderly so much different than we do in America, which here generally is to put them in an independent living facility away from the family. Mm -hmm. But there, they still incorporated, that seems to be the case with this plan de vida, several centenarians in Nicoya having that strong sense of purpose, which leads to a contribution to a greater good in the entire community. They're drinking a really hard water. It's the country, Costa Rica's highest calcium content is Hmm. in their water. Kind of like how that high polyphenol wine in Sardinia is a very specific thing that contributes to their centenarianism. So within their loop, these are some interesting things to note. High levels of calcium in their water. You're not likely to see an all-you-can-eat buffet in Nicoya. They (laughs) traditionally and culturally eat a very light dinner, eating fewer calories. Seems to be one of the surest ways to add years to your life. To keep moving, keep doing things, keep yourself busy, purpose. That makes perfect sense to me. I'm enjoying this Blue Zone conversation. I say we keep going with it. I mean, the original Blue Zone that was found was Okinawa, Japan. We could discuss that next week briefly. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, evolutionary moments are important to discuss. (laughs) It definitely helps you see the paths of things. It definitely helps you begin to formulate the next evolutionary steps of things to watch things unfold. You know, I'm a, we are boundary breakers, uh, new ideas. We create new ideas and then look at the creation. We're not afraid to incorporate new ideas or ideas that aren't culturally known where we live. Yeah. And so what I'm looking for in terms of the evolutionary process of the 
things that are happening out here on the farm is truly, is it an energetic balance? Does it feel wonderful? You know, and I was talking to Cortland last night. I just had a few minutes to talk to Cortland right before guests started arriving at the dinner last night. The kids were showing up and they were about to head off to dinner with my parents, which is a, a beautiful, unique opportunity for my my parents to get all four kids by themselves at dinner because we were busy doing our own thing. And I mentioned to Cortland just kind of what's happening with the business and things that are unrolling, and he's a finance major. So there comes that moment where we can say, first of all, we understand when does a, a business have the ability to even profit? It's got to be a few years, three years, four years, five years, Typically, right? Yeah. Right. And then the next conversation is, well, what are the intentions of this particular business? Is it to do more so that you make more money once you begin to actually create a cash flow that actually pays back and creates profit? Or is it premium, meaning your product just gets better? And I loved having this conversation with Cortland at the beginning of this whole thing because mm -hmm. it has got the flow of what we're thinking about with this evolutionary, like what he's studying finance and he's saying, A, do more, more people. Well, that doesn't feel like something I necessarily want to do. Okay. B, make a premium product. Ooh, I like that one. I want us to be like, it's the best. It's five-star farm to table in South Texas. Mm -hmm. That's great. I like that one. Okay. And then the third option is- It's a unique is, market. Yes, of course. And then the third option is really where I think I tend to fall into the most of the time is that there are things we love to do on the farm. The idea that we have regular farm to table dinners at our home, mm -hmm. <laughs> like not only are we not driving to San Antonio or flying to California or Maine or wherever we've been to do farm to table, special farm event type things, we're doing it in our own backyard. So we would travel to do the things we're doing in our own backyard. And so if the third option is we want to be able to live the lifestyle we want and running these events in this business atmosphere helps us create what we want right here on the farm. But and the, I love that. And the first day on the farm a few weeks ago, this dinner table talks salon, the first time we've done that. Mm -hmm. I've got some new firsts coming up too. I'm so excited about. I don't mind not thinking about the business end of it. This first one. Oh, absolutely. You was about to. molding and creating and trying to discover what the salon is. Yep. We have it in our head. Yep. We've had birthday salons right. prior, yep. but that's not exactly what we're doing. So how does it shift and whatever? And I think that at the end of the day, last night's salon gave me every indication that we are on the right track with these and we need to do another one yes. soon. Soon. Yeah. It was a great intimate table. Yeah. It was a perfect first time to do something I'll like that. I'll tell you if you missed it and you live in our area or can get to our area, do not miss the next one. I asked you a question last night. I said... Is this the first time that you have cooked like this publicly? Yes. And I was kind of trying to think about was. what is that wording? Mm -hmm. and, and it is. It's not about... Because you've cooked and we've talked about it on the podcast. You've cooked and I've served your food to other people. At your long lunch club events. Yeah. You've watched chefs and been up and talked you we the two of you have tag team done the talks at every cooking event in corpus christi for right. years like right. that we'll was mc those events right. in the past and yeah yeah exactly but this time this I'm, was you yeah. cooking the food I am the while chef. talking while teaching while right so like the long lunch club like the farm to table dinners we've talked about here on the show where we bring in a guest chef it was in the pavilion Mm -hmm. But I'm also making a couple of things, not for the first time, but certainly for the first time on that equipment out there, mm -hmm. knowing that there's not the pressure. I don't feel pressure, but I know I'm being observed. Mm -hmm. I glanced over at one time when I was tossing the Brussels sprouts. We'll get into them. Uh huh. Several of the guests were just watching me. Yeah. I love that. Because see, my back was to you because I was paying attention mm -hmm. to them and kind of trying to put on a show a little bit while to keep them distracted a little bit. But I love to know that like behind me, you were putting on this show of this cool, like I'm, and it's not a show, it's a functional show, but it's a show. People are watching. It's not a show like a hibachi grill show, right? but how we're preparing the farm fresh foods is certainly part of the allure. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. 
if you've listened over the last few weeks as we've led up to the salon, I was very insistent on not giving away any details about the food. Like my thought was, if you come, you get to learn then. Yeah. And that was fun. And we can change that up as we do when we do the next well, one. I think it's interesting to kind of attract people. I think that if people knew we had bacon cheeseburgers last night, like mm-hmm. we're not bringing you to the table to give you our most craziest things, not our most experimental things. Maybe next time. But we did some. Sure. So, you know, so there was some of that going on there at the table. One of the things I would add into it is that our communication about that stuff is really vital. And this is a thing that and I've it, it learned. It didn't go as well as it needed to. Well, what I've learned about working with chefs is, is that I kind of have to stay on them and be, and make sure they understand what ingredients are actually going to be available so that A, we're not spending money on things we shouldn't be spending money on because we've got it here at the farm. Sure. And B, you can actually prepare things using the abundance, the overflow of abundance of what's going on here at the farm. We had to do some tweaking on some things, but it worked out fabulously. So our thought, and a few things changed on the fly Mm -hmm. once the guests arrived and we could kind of see where the vibe was going. But our thought was people would arrive at seven. There would be all of the elements of a tasting board, the ones that you do at the Long Lunch Club, would be out. A little bit more of an appetizer up and walking around round is what I was wanting to create. They'd come in, grab a bite, grab a glass of wine, and we were going to go for a walk around the farm. Yeah, so we gave them a little taste of the wine that we make here at the farm, and we took them on a sunset walk around the farm. That's when I learned that one of our guests who was attending with another couple was from Rhode Island. And I immediately got really excited Mm -hmm. that we were going to be able to sit at the table for several hours and have this level of diversity in in the room. Ah, that jazzed me so, so much. Yep. And of course, during the walking tour with the schedule I had in my head, knowing when I had to get the spinach balls Uh into the oven, I just randomly said, if you'll excuse me, I have to go take out my balls and went back to the kitchen so that I could roll up. I have to stop you. I'm sorry. You have a spider crawling on your head. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's happening. There are, Wait, now it's in your beard. There are spiders everywhere around <laughs> here right now. This morning I pulled noticed? out spider webs out of my hair, you guys. <laughs> There he is scratching that spider out of his beard again. Think of the Adams family house. That's kind of like where we live. Anyway. It's spring, you guys. Did I get him? I don't know. Is it gone? It's hiding underneath Just your don't collar. don't bite me. Something stung me right before the event. And I, I went, it- what happened? I looked down and I couldn't see what it was. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, I could die from a brown recluse bite during the event. But it certainly would be memorable. I doubt it. So back in episode 3.31, one of the foods we talked about was spinach balls. Mm -hmm. Go back and listen to that. That's where the recipe is. And everyone liked that episode. They wanted to know more about the spinach balls. Well, they were very, very good. Mm -hmm. And we locked in spinach balls. And they're gluten-free. Weeks before the event. Like that was so good, we need to do them for the salon. Yes. And then last week... You were like, well, by the way, if we do spinach balls, there is no spinach. I was <laughs> there like, actually was a little bit of spinach. We are going to have to talk a little bit. <laughs> so what if I make the spinach balls, which I really wanted to do, because yes. I knew they would just be a crowd pleaser. Yes. But put something else in there. I know you're pulling all kinds of greens. Yep. So I harvested all of the flowering spinach, because the one thing about spinach is that when spinach starts to bolt flower, that's what I always tell you guys. It doesn't change to being bitter like lettuce does. It just gets small leaves and there's not much to it anymore. So I harvested all of what was left of even the flowering spinach. I harvested some beautiful Swiss chard. I harvested some Malabar spinach. I harvested some longevity spinach, kale, sweet potato leaves because those are starting to set and that's a really good alternative to spinach. And we just had some beautiful greens. You destemmed, so you pulled off some of the thicker pieces. You wash them, you take off all the hard parts, mm-hmm. the stems, you blanch them, and then you get rid of all the water, finely chop them, add them into your Parmesan, beaten egg, gluten free breadcrumbs, some spices. Go back, listen to 3.31, the whole recipe is there. But right before the event, we agreed there is no obsession over the agenda. If the flow is correct, we can slow things down. Mm -hmm. If the flow needs to be sped up, we could accelerate everything. And I 
put those spinach balls right in the oven when you guys return from the wall. Yeah, and the thing is, is that right as people arrived last night, I and especially some of our regulars, and I mentioned when we launched this thing that the regulars will show up. Like as soon as we announce it to the podcast, give the podcast listeners a couple of weeks, then there's going to be a couple of people that come to our farm to table dinners that will show up. Well, it goes back to what you said it exists right where it didn't exist before we would be taking full advantage of someone else doing this if it wasn't ourselves doing it right so as soon as they arrive i i kind of introduce them to the concept because they're not regular podcast listeners so i'm like let me tell you a little bit about this this is going to be a little bit different than what you do same delicious farm to table foods but it's a conversational dinner. So it's going to be really long and drawn out. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we talk about the podcast. We're putting on a salon. Have you guys heard of a salon? So we kind of start explaining what a salon was. And I loved that because it took us on a journey that started with this walk as the sun sets, easygoing conversations. Glass of wine in hand. You walk back to the pavilion. You kick into gear with throwing those cheese balls in the oven. We re-enter back into the room. We're getting set to the table. I point over at the local tasting board, which is a little different this time because I knew we were doing burgers, because I wanted us to have a really free and open table where it wasn't all crowded up with food the whole time, where it was just like, let's hang out at the table. Let's get comfortable. Let's, we have our space, you know, I put the local tasting board off to the side and it was a lot more crudité than it normally is. Lots of fresh vegetables, raw, tiny little yellow squash, Mm -hmm. beautiful scallions, Mm -hmm. Green beans, sugar snap peas, then carrots fruits. with the tops on. Yes, carrots, radishes, fruits like strawberries and mulberries, a little bit of gluten free bread. I used some of our little jelly. I made up some pecans that were roasted in honey and some of my hot pepper that we used to make. What's so one like, of the themes of the podcast? My homemade ranch dressing. Exactly. And then, of course, all those different types of pickles that my mom makes, those are great for crudite, but they're also great for, okay, grab some of that and put it on your burger. Got these delicious heirloom cherry tomatoes. The little bit of decorations that were on the table were the most beautiful, fresh little flowers that I get out of my garden. And then of course, a pile of just beautiful, fresh vegetables. So as we come to sit down at the table, before you've served the spinach balls and everybody's making their little charcuterie plate, their little crudite plate. They're coming over to the table and I'm like, well, so that you know, everything on the table is edible. And one of the ladies that's a regular to the farm to table thing, she says, that's one of the things that I love about coming out here. Everything's edible. And I'm like, well, if there wasn't anything edible on this table, I would certainly point it out to you. But that was the beginning stages of just kind of letting people know, what are we doing here? I mean, we're talking about hours at the table with the same group of people, intimate conversation. And you need an icebreaker. Yeah. Some of these folks were meeting for the very first time. They're meeting us for the very first time. They're meeting one another for the very first time. So I had gone through a lot of the show notes over at dinnertabletalks.com. And I found five or six of some past random questions of the week. Mm -hmm. One of our guests pulled one out from the hat. The question that she pulled was from episode 1.19, What's the best junk food ever created? So 1.19 is early. That's early in the first season. 19 episodes in. Yes. The kids were still at home. So we probably had the kids having this conversation with us. It was a great icebreaker. Let's talk about food. Here we are at the dinner table. And we got this pile of healthy food in front of us. Yes. Let's talk about the other stuff too. Yes. And let's be honest. And the first person that drew it out, she just goes... I just love delicious plain old potato chips. And I'm like, me too. Are you, are you brand loyal? No. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> just, and she goes, I just don't want anything on it. Yes. Like, so not a sour cream and onion chip, not a barbecue chip, just salty potato chips. Yep, exactly. They are so good, especially when the bag is fresh. Mm-hmm. They're nice and crisp. We did learn about how easy it would be for me to get access to another locally made delicious toffee covered chocolate from our little local area over here because one of the guests favorite snack is toffee covered chocolate <laughs> is it a heath bar yeah is heath bar's okay in a pinch i'm talking about the place that makes them locally like over right over here in the neighboring town what? 
and here I am telling him, don't encourage him to buy me stuff that he brings home that I'm not supposed to eat that I'll eat because I eat too much junk. And I'll have some of those toffees and I'll have some of those potato chips. We both gave the same answer that we gave back in episode 1.19. It's interesting that we haven't changed in that way. You said cheesy poof, the cheesy balls. Yep. yep. And like so Cheeto did one balls. of the other guests. She said Cheetos, cheese yeah. puffs, cheesy. And, and I said a food so bad for you that I just will not eat it. But I remember it. That's Little Debbie's oatmeal cream pies. And I was like, oh, what about the double chocolate, Little Debbie? And what about the... <laughs> All right, everybody be quiet now. It's time to eat some more tomatoes. Yes. It was a very good ice-breaking conversation. I think at that point, people were like, okay, we get this. It's going to be a while. You know, we're hanging out. And so then at the perfect timing, those cheese balls were ready. They're not spinach balls. We're going to call them green balls Mm -hmm. because it's all full of your greens, all different kinds, on parchment paper. So just quickly dump them into the serving bowl, Mm -hmm. throw out some more ranch that Uh you could dip into, pour on your plate if you wanted to. Yep. And I said, okay, guys, a few episodes ago, I made spinach balls. I'm just a little nervous about this because it's the exact same recipe. Uh Uh-huh. All these different And everyone goes, oh, I'll try one. Uh Uh-huh. I said, you're not going to stop at one. Uh-huh. If, just if what first. I've done worked <laughs> out, they were better than the spinach balls. <laughs> they were so good. And there and was they were one warm, left. warm and they were you, gooey. You know and... how you go to a dinner with several people and uh-huh. you order something and there's uh-huh. seven uh-huh. and there's six people uh-huh. and everybody gets one. And then there's the one that stays on the plate. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Take this. Come on. Let's go. Uh Take this. Same thing happened with the delicious deviled eggs. We didn't even mention the deviled (laughs) eggs. That was was in the local board. Right. Yes. And someone at the table said, these are the best things I've eaten here. And then, no, these are the best deviled eggs I've ever eaten. Okay. This was the first of several ego strokes (laughs) that I received. Because I'm sure that there's a, a level of politeness in there, uh-huh. right? Oh, these are the best I've ever had because uh-huh. I just want to compliment my hosts uh-huh. and, you know, whatever. They were good. I ate them too. Mm. So what I did with the deviled <laughs> eggs was the basic deviled egg recipe. You've got mayonnaise along with the cooked yolks, right? Uh-huh. After you've cut the eggs in half, along with mustard. I think and was, I insisted I think there was a splash, on mustard seeds. Yeah, I think there was a splash of vinegar. Uh-huh. We buy a mustard that's mostly seeds. Mm-hmm. So you did want some of that in there. Mm-hmm. But then, Dill, fresh dill. Right. And here's what I did. I doubled the dill. It was so good. I doubled the dill. So they were very dill forward. You put a tiny sprig of dill. It on looked on like top a perfect little dill bouquet every right single on top. One. <laughs> the other conversation we had was that our there are eggs. Uh-huh. Right. Let me clarify. There are chicken's <laughs> eggs. And what I notice when you get a deviled egg at a fancy restaurant is that there's a nice border Thick of edge. the of the white. Uh-huh. So there's a trick that chefs know to get it right. Yeah, or it's a function of farm. Let's do an eggs. unanswered question on this one. Good, good call. Then we told some fun stories about our dating with the amuse bouche. Well, that was the point of the spinach balls. Right. Was between the tasting dish yep. and the main entree, we would present an amuse bouche. Yes. When we first started dating, we went to a fancy high dollar... Farm to table restaurant in in San Antonio. Because nothing, nothing like that existed anywhere near us. So on a weekend trip to San Antonio, we found out about this restaurant, Gwendolyn it's called. And between courses, multi-course, small bite thing, the chef is offering this amuse-bouche. Yes. We had a little telepathy. Do you know what an amuse-bouche is? I don't know what an amuse-bouche is. So rather than going, well, thank you. For my amuse-bouche, we will enjoy it. I looked up at the waitress and I said, "Uh, we don't know what that is. What's an amuse-bouche? It's the idea that the chef is offering something off menu, just a little taste of something special. I wanted to do that at the dinner last night. Mm -hmm. That's what the spinach balls were. Yep, it sure was. And people loved it and they loved the story too. I said in front of everyone to you, I need to know when we want our entree and side in 30 minutes. And I said now. I had pre-halved the Brussels sprouts. They were all washed and ready to go. Dump olive oil into the Brussels sprouts, plenty of salt and pepper, and I'm tossing them that way that I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Dump them out onto the baking sheets and put the flat cut side down. And this is when the, the show is occurring. Joe's back The cooking there. show part? Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, the other parts were just like prepping and plating the way that I do for the mm-hmm. Long Lunch Club. But this was where they got to watch you cook a hamburger and cook Brussels sprouts and do all of these different steps and then plate it. And you really did all of that 
by yourself for the most part. Well, it had been prepped the hell out of to make it as easy as possible on myself. And there was plenty of room. And I talked about how when you watch, when you have watched another guy, and we've we've got the chefs here, and there's a lot of people in the room. It's crowded in yeah, there Yeah, I was going to say it's a larger event. So that was the thing about this that was really nice for you and the evolution of different types of events and things like that. It's like, we've got this idea. We want to cook in the same room with people that are coming to eat at the dinner table with us. And we want to do it at the pavilion. And what's it going to look like? How's it going to work? How many people should be in a room when Joe, how many plates can you play comfortably? How many servers do you need? You know, well, we and we're not this. trying to put together 25 plates. Well, we're we trying had... to put together eight to 10 plates. And we had picked a simple dish to play. Let's be honest. Yes. But let's make it as pretty as we can. Yeah. I feel like I say this a lot. When we were first dating, we went to Austin for some event mm -hmm. and went to a food truck. I don't even think it's there anymore called Bravas Tapas or yep. Tapas Bravas. Yep. And you said, ooh, they've got Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. And we got them from and this from this food Brussels truck. They were the best Brussels sprouts I've ever eaten. <laughs> I don't want to use too much offensive language, uh -huh. but they were the best Joe. Brussels sprouts <laughs> that we have ever eaten together. They were so good. They are the gold standard by which every time I prepare Brussels sprouts, I am striving toward. I am trying to attain mm -hmm. this level of flavor. So the night before the event, I mix together my sauce, which is one part balsamic vinegar. And I'm not talking about that liquidy, watery balsamic vinegar, aged balsamic vinegar. The Thick, good stuff. The good stuff. Mm-hmm. And one part honey, mm -hmm. and then a quarter part, or basically a squirt of habanero sauce, some kind of hot Belizean sauce. Belizean hot sauce, yeah. And that is it. Mm -hmm. Mix, 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 mix. Set over to the side. The recipe says that these are going to be crispy, almost burnt, like just, just the, the edge of burnt Brussels sprouts. And that's exactly what I'm going for. Between 20 and 30 minutes, those things are going to be in there for the full 30 minutes. I want them charred. I want them crispy. Mm-hmm. Let me turn around and begin making my burger. My patties are all pre-made. The buns we got from uh, our good friend. Let them eat cake, Michelle. And she does an amazing job, and I always the, want the, to continue. We're not going to get a bag yeah. of store buns. No, 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 no. no. Mm -hmm. We're going to a local bakery to get the best buns we can. We did have to do a little gluten-free thing. You used a bagel with everything on it for me and one of the other guests that was gluten-free as well. I thought it would be a perfect opportunity for you to say there is a touch here of something we've been discussing on the podcast over the last month or so, everything, everywhere, all at once. There is an everything bagel. We talked about it last week. So for the gluten-free option for the buns, you and our other guests from Rhode Island, I didn't have a gluten-free bun. Right. So I did have some gluten-free everything bagels. Yep. He says that this is an everything bagel and there's this movie that, and as soon as you say there's this movie, two of the guests go, oh, we saw that movie and it was so good. And then it, the party goes into movie conversations mm -hmm. and we're talking about everything everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about my experience the first time I saw it and the second time I saw it. Now we're talking about movie theater popcorn, which by the way, one of the guests favorite snack the the little snack that you know the cheese puffs the chocolate hers was popcorn and so the best popcorn the best movie theater great movies talking about multiverse movies it was a fun what i would call a dinner table talk why do you think we landed on a bacon cheeseburger because I think that that is a standard good dish that everyone enjoys. I think it's something you're very comfortable making. It's one of your quick make things. When you need to make something quick, you make a burger. And it's also a dish that you cannot get, that you, Aislinn, That's correct. cannot go get at any restaurant in town. That's correct. If you're yes. going to use fresh, clean yes. Ground beef meat. and bacon and cheese and then well, an let me, let me array get, let me give of the beautiful breakdown. vegetables that are all were all grown locally in this season. Yeah, let me give the breakdown. Ground beef from Edelin Farm. Yep. This gave us the opportunity to talk about all our farmer friends. Bacon too, again. from Turkey Hollow Farm. Yep. A melting quesadilla cheese mm -hmm. from Canali Farms that is our local one dairy. of our dairy. Mm-hmm. Lettuce was the hardest thing to find because of the time, time of, of season year. that we're in. Yep. But yep. one of our vendors at the farmer's market had some beautiful romaine lettuce. Mm -hmm. 
You had another farmer's market vendor that got us some big, big, perfect big sized tomatoes. tomatoes. Everyone yes. else had cherry tomatoes. I needed big slicing tomatoes. They came through. I had a beautiful white onion yeah. that I just harvested perfectly time for this. And then the pickles that My your mom mom's makes. hamburger pickle slices. Dishes of mustard, ketchup, I whispered mayonnaise. in your ear over at the counter over there, okay, next time we do burgers, we got to make a special mayonnaise and yeah, mustard Yeah, we need to make ketchup. that stuff homemade. Uh-huh. That would be a really good idea. Yeah, that's For fun. next time. It was great. We also dressed the plate with um, a little sprig of dill and a nasturtium flower because I just want people to taste these. Nasturtium flowers are so tasty, you guys. So to throw that little bit of like spicy pepper flavor on top of your burger, mm-hmm. that was fantastic. And then, of course, if they wanted to dress their burger some more, there's candied jalapenos still over there. You've got some other things you could put on your burger. Well, I enjoyed that, that. Throughout the night, people would go back over to your crudite, your tasting plate, and grab just a couple more little things. Mm-hmm. And everything they're grabbing is healthy and good to eat. Yeah. Locally made, certainly. So I've got my buns toasted, and they're on the plate. I've got my bed of fixins ready to go. Mm-hmm. All I have to do now is put the patty that has the cheese and the bacon already on it, yep. put it on the bun, pour my Brussels sprouts on, and serve. Yep. Coordination. Mm-hmm. And those Brussels sprouts aren't ready. Mm -hmm. And they've gone the full 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Will these burgers and buns get too done if I just wait five more minutes? Mm -hmm. So I go back over to the table. The burgers aren't quite ready yet, but it's all plated. And I go back over five minutes later. I look at my, I'm like, gosh, darn it. These aren't what I want them to be. But I know that if they could be in there a little bit longer that they would be, So I make the executive decision. They're on two separate trays. There's two trays of them. I'm going to serve Brussels sprouts two ways. Mm -hmm. Because if I can get some Brussels sprouts on the table with the explanation that these aren't quite where I want them to be, but let's just taste them in this state. Mm -hmm. As we're eating our burgers, 15 minutes, 20 minutes later, whatever it is, I can go get the burnt ones that I'm looking for. Mm Mm-hmm. Have a second taste. Have a second yeah. round yeah. that's yeah. a little more, it's a little closer to what I want them to be. I'll tell you, there was so much food on that table that we just stuffed ourselves and stuffed ourselves and stuffed ourselves. It was funny because while you were going through that kind of tornado of decision making over there, the conversation of tornado actually came up at the table for some reason. Uh-huh. And I loved that people got into the concept of a conversationalist dinner. They had to warm up to it. I think people showed up not knowing exactly what to expect. We said last week there's an air of mystery to this thing. But once they understood with that random question of the week. And I was trying to come up with some kind of concept that would be the dinner table talk. And I didn't really know what would occur. I knew a dinner table talk would occur. But I threw one particular thing and said, okay, let's ask everybody what their homestead would look like. So it turned into us hearing more about one of the guests homestead and what it looks like. And she showed us some pictures and she's like, we're right on the coast. And I looked and there was this, you could see that there was a storm in the photo and that you can see the water or the, we're, we're within five minutes from the water. And then she started telling this story about a tornado. And now we're talking about weather. And this is a salon. Because we're telling our stories, we're telling how we solved problems, we're telling the delicious foods we eat, we're telling how we cook and how we learn from the things that we're eating, talking about all of our different kids and the things that they're into. And one of the stories was how one of their daughters works for Tesla and is a traveling mechanic for Tesla. So basically she goes to places where they don't have a service store and does service for Tesla machines. Mm -hmm. But you can't get those kinds of necessarily those types of conversations at a big farm to table dinner where everyone's broken up into four tops and there's a chef and there's servers. So this was the thing about this salon that was really important to us because we were bringing to life the dinner table with people we'd maybe never had a conversation with before. Right. And clearly there's going to be some kind of dessert. Yes. And my mom is usually the one that helps me out with the desserts or helps me make decisions about desserts. And this time I asked her, I said, I want to use the mulberries because mulberries are so seasonal. And I'm sure that this is the case everywhere, especially for different types of fruiting trees with berries on them and things like that, where it's like, you're not going to be able to get this any other time of year. You've got about a two week window where either the wind blows it all off, the birds eat them all. And you've got to get what you're going to get and make what you're going to make with it. Okay, mulberry, mulberry wine. We make wine. A dessert. It's after dinner, the long conversational dinner where we've had a sip of wine. And how do we round this out? And so my mom made some mulberry sorbet. 
that did have some port wine in it. And it was questionable to both of us even before we served it up. Like we had a little taste test. Yeah, it was it was thick and sweet. Sweet. And we ended up adding lime juice to it. Was that your idea or did that, that come out of a idea. recipe? No, that was my idea because I use lime juice as clarifying. And see, there was no test kitchen. She made it and that's what was going to be served. Well, it was tested a couple days before, mm-hmm. but it was like, we only have mulberries this many days. Right. And it's like, this is what it is so and we're going for it. When we had our taste test, mm-hmm. tasted it without the lime, tasted it with the lime. And it was like, okay, no, this is perfect. Significantly better than that pop of tartness to the sweetness. Yes. And then you were going to add some spearmint. Yeah, you put some fresh spearmint mm-hmm. on top of it. And then a little bloody dock, which is a sorrel, a pretty leaf, you know, just making it pretty. Right. I think that people appreciated that finish to mm-hmm. the meal because it was light and it was different. And I think that there's an element of, and this is an important part of the evolutionary growth of what's happening here at the farm. There's so much that feels good out here. There's so much that inspires you and just makes you feel good. And you're being served a meal and it's family style and it's kind of fancy and it feels special. And it's got these little touches of port wine mulberry sorbet at the end after a meaty delicious cheeseburger you know we bookended the evening with a second random question of the week yeah and the question was for episode Mm 2.47 what food connects you most to your childhood Another great conversation because this had kind of already come up at the table to talk about just different types of things that your parents prepared and loving fresh vegetables. This was one of the answers, but I understand this answer completely like being brought up in a family where delicious homemade garden, fresh vegetables. Yeah, I think her grandmother had a garden. Yeah, those things matter. And of course, that's why you're at the table is because those things mattered to you through life and they still matter to you to this day, Mm -hmm. the way I am about it as well. I thought that it was interesting that we also had a brother-sister at the table, which meant that their story of childhood was overlapping, Mm -hmm. was within the same recipe. It's the conversation where it was, well, my mom... We had a a staff member that cooked our meals for us. And my mom made the same dishes every day of the week. So it was like Monday meatloaf, but Wednesday was my favorite day. And Wednesday was fried chicken, mashed potatoes. I was like, oh my God, I I can hardly imagine. I said, (laughs) so that was kind of like your mom's thing. Like, where did that rigidness come from? Every Monday meatloaf, every Wednesday fried chicken. She goes, whoa, 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 well, that, the, the housekeeper made it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I got you. I'm with yeah. you. It was like a, this was the planned meal. The housekeeper the house. knew five things. <laughs> yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> it rolled us into that conversation about how sandwiches and tacos and pizzas are some of our favorite foods and everybody's grandmother or someone makes you a sandwich. It just tastes better with love, you know, just a truly dinner table event. I had brought two or three kind of fancy special beers that we shared throughout the evening for anyone that wanted a taste. Yes. And then... You had the record player set up. The record player was set up. I thought the soundtrack was fantastic. You were doing a great DJ job on the record player. Good job. No scratching. That'll be next time we get together. (laughs) Now we're sitting there basically at a clear table. I bring Uh out another beer. I bring a bottle of wine over. We're not kicking you out. Uh This is going to end when it organically ends. Mm -hmm. And then it just got to that point where I think everyone was like, well... Yep. I need to probably go to sleep. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's time. and so uh, it's time. everyone left at the same time. Our kids were over at your parents' house. They come over and help us load up all the dishes yes, to take over did. to our house. I've got to get over to the pavilion and clean off the flat top grill uh-huh. when we get done recording this. The chickens ha- got all of the food waste this morning. They're very, very happy. And I think it's a... Uh, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. And it was a success. And, and we look forward to doing it again. We're going to do it again, right? As soon as we've got a date on the calendar, we'll let you guys know. We got to also contend with the idea that it's getting hotter and hotter outside. It's, yesterday was a high heat index. Yeah. When so, the sun went down, it b- became pretty perfect. It, yeah. It became perfect. That's yeah. true. And I think we'll roll through how different things work and we'll figure it out. I have some ideas. Well, hey, while we're in this intellectual vibe, why don't you kick over a question that we can deep dive into? Well, we talked about random questions of the week that we brought out of the archive to enjoy at our meal last night. Mm-hmm. I've got one for you here. Awesome. I'd love to hear it. What is the first thing you notice when you meet new people? 
What is the first thing I notice when I meet new people? I think the first thing I notice when I meet new people is their energy. Like, how do I feel when I'm in a, in the space with people? I think that's the first thing I notice. But when I think about like, what is the visual image of people that I almost always have? Oddly, it's almost, they're always their shoes. Like oh, I have a thing about shoes where I look at people's shoes and like... Their shoes say so much about them? I guess so. I don't know. Because I do think about that. I, I think about shoes. I think about eyes because I look people directly in eyes. And then I think about how close they get to me when I'm talking to them. Like oh. the space that... So I think that that's what makes me think about the energy. Like what's the energy of this person? Eyes, shoes, space management. There's a flow going on here. What's this person's vibe? Do you have a preference on space? People get too close, you don't like it, do like it? I don't mind if you come into my space for a greeting, a hug, a kiss on the cheek, a handshake. That part I don't mind. But then when we go to conversate, I like to have my own like six feet. <laughs> I like to have my space. <laughs> we went to that movie event a couple of weeks ago and one of the guys that I love, uh -huh. he's a close talker. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking it, about? I No, I don't, but I always have to step back He's from a people. close talker. And, and, and he wants to put his hand you. on you, on your shoulder, and then oh. he'll begin gently massaging. And it's not weird or creepy or anything Yeah, no, like that. I don't dig that do at all. Do you know all. who I'm talking about? I think maybe. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't dig that at all. I don't do, yeah, people that, like, that. that's too much touching. I haven't learned the social graces yet of, get your hand off me. Well, because I'm a woman, I drop a shoulder real quick. And usually most men get the hint or most people get the hint. But interestingly enough, the one that doesn't work necessarily for someone that's a close talker is you step back and then they they back you into a corner. Right. They follow you. That makes it really hard for me because I start to feel like a lion in a corner. <laughs> you need one of those human soccer inflatables <laughs> around you. When I meet someone new, the first thing I notice is a generally, because I'm trying very hard to shift away from like physical attributes, like in general, mm -hmm. I want to be a person that doesn't notice and put value on you about your skin color or your appearance or your shoes, you shoe snob <laughs> joke. I do. I do. I am a little bit of a shoe snob. It's sure. how introverted and extroverted you are in the moment. How quiet you are. Am I having to draw out? Or maybe you're so mm -hmm. introverted that you don't even want to converse with anybody. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's yes. the cues yes. that I'll typically pick yeah, on. Or, that's vibes. Or if it's you're a huge extrovert. Yeah. It's then making sure that I don't get into a competition with you, yeah, which I will do without louder even thinking. Right. Oh, yeah. You think that's a good story? I got an even better story. And we're talking faster together. Yeah. And everyone's gone because we're just like this weird energy. Manic, loud, like mess. How introverted, extroverted you are, or if, another way to say it, how much you want to talk or how clearly you do not. That's the one of the first things I notice about yeah. people. Yeah. That's because I think that... You're maybe personally for yourself gauging that. Trying to work on a couple of things. Yeah, me too. Always. Our first Dinner Table Talks salon. Well, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Dinner Table Talks. We will be back next Monday with a fresh episode. In the meantime... Hit us up on social media, send us an email, DM us, whatever. We want to hear from you. And we hope that you're enjoying the episodes as much as we enjoy creating them for you. <laughs>